This video is made possible by the free-to-play action game Crossout. Check out the game through the link in the description below, and you can start with three extra weapons or a vehicle cabin just for registering. In the 1970s, BP oil pipeline workers came across a curious item about 12 miles southwest of Cruden Bay, Aberdeenshire, sitting about 86 miles under the surface. And this was a German U-boat. In fact, it was one of the last U-boats ever sunk in World War II. Unlike so many of its fellow subs, however, this one's demise came about owing to a sequence of events all stemming from someone flushing the toilet incorrectly. Well, so what exactly happened here? U-1206, a Type 7C submarine, was officially ordered on April 2, 1942, and ultimately launched on December 30, 1943. About a year and a half later, on April 6, 1945, the shiny new craft, with its crew of 50 men, departed from Kristiansand, Norway, on its first non-training patrol mission. Pertinent to the topic at hand is that while most submarines at the time used a storage tank to stow the product of flushing onboard toilets and other wastewater, with stereotypical German engineering efficiency, U-boat designers went the other way and decided to eject the waste directly into the ocean. On the plus side, this saved valuable space within the submarine while also reducing weight. The downside, of course, was that ejecting anything into the ocean required greater pressure inside than out. As a result, U-boats had long required that in order to use the toilets, the ship would have to be near the surface. Of course, being so close to or on the surface is generally to be avoided when on patrol if a subcaptain wants to see his ship not blown up. This resulted in crewmen who needed to purge their orifices while submerged needing to do so in containers, which would then be stored appropriately until the sub needed to surface and then the offending substances could be ditched overboard. As you can imagine, this didn't exactly improve the already less than ideal smell of the air within a submarine while it was plodding away down under. But there really wasn't much that could be done about this. That is, until some unknown German engineers designed a high-pressure evacuation system. As to how this system worked, in a nutshell, the contents of the toilet were piped into an airlock of sorts. Once the offending matter found its way into said airlock, this would be sealed and subsequently pressurized. This eventually got to a point where a valve could be opened and the matter would be ejected out into the sea. This all brings us to eight days into the patrol mission on April the 14th, 1945. Now, before we take this much further, we should note that there are two versions of the story of what happened next. One version is stated by literally every single source we could find discussing this on the interwebs, as well as being repeated on the show QI and found in countless books on the subject. As for the other version, if you dig a little deeper, thanks to the good people at the Deutsches U-Boat Museum archive, you can actually find the official account from 26 seven-year-old Captain Karl Adolf Schlitt, who, minus a couple of letters in his last name, couldn't have been more aptly named for what was about to happen next. All this said, in both cases, the root cause of the sub sinking were the same improper use of the toilet's flushing mechanism. That caveat out of the way, as the vessel was cruising along at around 70 meters below the surface and about 8 miles from Peterhead, Aberdeenshire, Scotland, the popular version states that Captain Schlitz had the need of evacuating his bowels, and so, no doubt with the dignity befitting a man of his stature and rank, he did his business in the toilet. That done, he was now left to try and flush the thing. Unable to figure out the complicated contraption, Captain Schlitt called in help from the WC Waste Disposal Unit Manager, literally the only guy on board officially trained in how to flush the toilet. Apparently he was also known amongst the crew as, translated, the <laughs> man. Unfortunately for the men that would soon die as a result, for whatever reason, the crewman who was supposed to know how to flush the toilet made a mistake and turned the wrong valve. That is the popular version to which we could not find any primary document to support it, despite it being very widely parroted. As for the official version, Captain Schlitt himself claimed, In April 1945, U-1206 was in the North Sea off Britain. On board, the diesel engines were faulty. We could not charge our batteries by the snorkel anymore. In order to get the diesels working again, we had to put down about 8 to 10 miles from the British coast at 70 MTS unseen by British patrols. I was in the engine room when, at the front of the boat, there was a water leak. What I have learned is that a mechanic had tried to repair the forward WC's outboard vents. I would say, although I do not have any proof, that the outer vent indicator either gave false readings or none at all. As to why said mechanic was attempting to work on the toilet's outboard vent while that deeply submerged, that's every bit as much of a mystery as to why an engineer trained in how to properly flush the toilet would have screwed it up so 
so badly in the Captain Schlitt pooping version of the story. Of course, it's always possible that the good captain made up his version of things to avoid personal embarrassment, and perhaps the other version came from crew members giving a very different account, but we could not locate any crew member's version of events in order to verify that. Whichever story is true, the result in either case was the contents of the toilet, if any, and the ocean outside shooting like a jet stream into the submarine. But things were about to get a whole lot worse. You see, as alluded to in Captain Schlitt's account, the U-1206 was a diesel electric sub featuring twin Germania Werft F-46 four-stroke engines which charged a bank of batteries which in turn powered two electric motors capable of producing 750 horsepower combined. The problem was that the batteries were directly below the toilet area. According to Captain Schlitt, when the water rushed in, the batteries were covered with seawater. Chlorine gas started to fill the boat. As this was all happening, Captain Schlitt ordered the vessel to surface. He then states, the engineer who was in the control room at the time managed to make the boat buoyant and surfaced despite severe flooding. So here they were, diesel engines down for maintenance, batteries soaking in seawater, having taken on a significant amount of said water, chlorine gas filling the ship, and they were on the surface just off the coast of enemy territory. The nightmare for Captain Schlitt, it was about to get even worse though. As noted in his account of events, we were then incapable of diving or moving. At this point, British planes and patrols discovered us. With few options available, Captain Schlitt ordered various valves on the U-1206 be opened in order for it to fill with water, after which the crew abandoned the sub with it shortly thereafter sinking. The crew made their way to the Scottish coast on rubber rafts, but things didn't go well here either. Schlitt states, In the attempt to negotiate the steep coast in heavy seas, three crew members tragically died. Several men were taken on board a British sloop. The dead were Hans Bachar, Karl Corrin, and Emil Krupa. Ultimately, ten crewmen did make it to shore, but just like their surviving compatriots at sea, they were promptly captured. In the aftermath, thankfully for just about everyone, 16 days later, on April 30, 1945, Hitler bravely and with no regard for his own personal safety infiltrated the Führer bunker and single-handedly managed to rid the world of one of its most notorious individuals of all time by putting a bullet through his own brain. About a week after that, Germany finally surrendered. As for what happened to Captain Schlitz after this, it isn't clear, other than that he appears to have lived to the ripe old age of 90, dying on April 7, 2009. Now, fortunately, in the online game Crossout, you don't have to worry about faulty toilets when building your own combat vehicle. And I want to tell you about that game before we get into today's bonus facts. And the best way for me to do that is to show you the game. So let's jump over to the computer. Hey guys, welcome to Crossout, the game. Obviously, it's a game. Uh, this is what we played with last time. If you've seen me do these before, you saw I played. I kitted my guy out with all of these awesome jetpacks, except it turns out they suck because I have no idea how to drive with them. No, I don't want to test drive. I want to... I'm gonna put my, uh, I'm gonna put the tracks back on. What the actual hell is that? I, that is way larger than I expected, and I'm definitely having some of that. <laughs> what? I think I've essentially built a tank. Let's, uh, let's add some machine guns on there just for, you know, giggles. All right, so we got to, uh, there's this big thing in the middle we got to protect, and then these Leviathans come, and we got to just destroy them. Uh, or they'll usually destroy me. Uh, I think I just fired my... That was a bit of a waste, because I... Oh, God, I'm getting shot. Sh this is this is a problem. I don't have any short, short range. Oh, no, I just launched it at the sky. I don't have any short range weapons. Is everyone hiding? Why are we all hiding over here? Is that the bad guy? Shall I launch my... Look at this. You ready for this? Oh, ho, ho. I hope we don't have friendly fire, because... So yeah, join us on the battlefield for free. Uh, if you sign up using our link below, you can get a starter set, three extra weapons, or a vehicle cabin just for registering. It also helps support the show, so that's awesome. Link below. So that's Cross Out. Check out the game through the link in the description below, and you can start with three extra weapons or a vehicle cabin just for registering. And now let's get into those bonus facts. The practice of calling the toilet the head was originally a maritime euphemism. This came from the fact that classically the toilet on a marine vessel, or at least where everyone would relieve themselves, was at the front of the ship the head. This was so that the water from the sea that splashed up on the front of the boat would wash the waste away. The first documented evidence of the term used to describe a toilet area was from 1708 by Woods Rogers, governor of the Bahamas, in his work Cruising Voyage Around the World. And now for another bonus fact. Toilet paper has been around since at least the 6th century AD, initially in China. It wouldn't be until the late 19th century that it was introduced to America and England. 
So what did people use before wiping with toilet paper? Well, this depended greatly on the region, personal preference, and wealth. Rich people often used hemp, lace, or wool. The 16th century French writer Francois Rabelais recommended the neck of a goose that is well down. Poor people would poop in rivers and clean off with water, rags, wood shavings, leaves, hay, rocks, sand, moss, seaweed, apple husks, seashells, ferns, and pretty much whatever else was at hand. For seamen, the common thing was to use old frayed anchor cables. The Inuits and other people living in frigid regions tended to go with clumps of snow to wipe with, which, other than the coldness factor, is actually one of the better options compared to many of the other aforementioned methods. Who <laughs> what? A rock? Going back a ways in history, we know the ancient Romans' favorite wiping item, including in public restrooms, was a sponge on a stick that would sit in salt water and be placed back in the salt water when done, waiting for the next person. Back to America, one extremely popular wiping item for a time was corn cobs, and later Sears and Roebuck's Farmer's Almanac and other catalogs became popular. The Farmer's Almanac even came with a hole in it so it could easily be hung in bathrooms for just this purpose. Reading and wiping material in one there are no doubt boosting their sales. Around 1857, Joseph Gaetti came up with the first commercially available toilet paper in the United States. His paper, The Greatest Necessity of the Age, Gaetti's medicated paper for the water closet, was sold in packages of flat sheets that were moistened and soaked with aloe. Gaiety's toilet paper sold for about 50 cents a pack, that's $12 today, with 500 sheets in that package. Despite its comfort and superiority at cleaning, this wasn't terribly popular, presumably because up to that point most people got their wiping materials for free from whatever was at hand, and humans hate change and newfangled innovations. Around 1867, brothers Edward Clarence and Thomas Scott, who sold products from a pushcart, started making and selling toilet paper as well. They did it a bit better than Gaiety. Their original toilet paper was much cheaper as it was not coated with aloe and moistened, but was just rolls of somewhat soft paper, although it often came with splinters. As the indoor flushable toilet started to become popular, so did toilet paper. This is not surprising considering there was nothing really to grab in an indoor bathroom to wipe with, unlike outdoors where nature is at your disposal. The age-old Farmer's Almanac and similar such catalogues were not well suited for this purpose because their pages tended to clog up the pipes in indoor plumbing. Even once it became popular, wiping with toilet paper still doesn't appear to have been painless until surprisingly recently. The aforementioned splinter problem seems to have been somewhat common until a few decades into the 20th century. In the 1930s, this changed with such companies such as Northern Tissue boasting a splinter-free toilet tissue. As for today, toilet paper is still extremely popular, though wet wipes similar to Gaiety's have made a major comeback in recent years, much to the chagrin of sewer workers the world over. Much like our forebears who shunned Gaiety's innovation, vastly superior toilet seat add-on bidet systems that take 10 minutes to install and only cost $30, literally paying for themselves in drastic reduction of toilet paper usage relative relatively quickly and providing significantly better cleaning are still largely shunned for some reason. If you'd like a toilet seat add-on bidet and would like to support our show, please do feel free to click on our Amazon affiliate link in the description below. And on that note, I really do hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this every day of the week. Also, please do check out our fantastic sponsor. There is a link in the description below. And as always, thank you for watching.